Sorry. I farted. Episode 4 of Dragon Ball Daima is here, and while the episode was fairly low-key overall, there were absolutely some moments that brought the hype. Let's break it all down and get right into today's review. The episode begins with, actually, it begins without the opening narration I went over last week. Now I'm totally confused. It was there in episode one, then absent in two, then it was there in episode three, and now it's gone again. So either it's an every other episode thing, or the more likely scenario. It's there when they need it to pad out the length of an episode if it's a few seconds too short. And here I thought Toei was doing it out of the goodness of their hearts to educate the kids on Goku's many adventures as he grew into adulthood. What a fool I was. The actual episode picks up right where we left off last week. Our main trio is now without a ship, so they are forced to walk in a random direction, hoping they stumble upon some kind of vehicle that they can use. Goku immediately suggests flying instead, but quickly learns that the heavy air makes something he totally takes for granted on Earth extremely difficult here in this alien world. It tires you out very quickly, so he's basically unable to fly here in the demon realm unless it's just a short distance. This scene is very reminiscent of a scene in GT Episode 4, where Goku's first instinct when his ship is stolen was to try using instantaneous movement. In GT, Goku also learns he's no longer able to use one of his signature techniques. To be fair, I actually like that scene in GT, and I like this scene in Daima too. In both cases, we see a Goku that is forced to face a harsh reality. In this new form as a kid, things won't be as easy as before. Goku is significantly weakened. He's slowed down. He's nerfed. And if your goal is to dial things back a bit, give us some more grounded combat, and return to the fun and adventure of the original Dragon Ball, slowing Goku down a bit is a good idea. While GT struggled to keep that old school feeling alive as the series progressed, four episodes in, Daima is absolutely nailing the more grounded feel with its fights. I can absolutely believe that under these harsh conditions, random demons could at least cause a bit of trouble for one of the most powerful beings in the universe. There's some tension in these fights, which is nice. Once they reach the Sea of Darkness, they're forced to fly, which is okay for short distances. Assuming you aren't attacked by a giant Dragon Quest monster. Glorio is able to take the huge, intimidating beast out with ease. Watching this, it's pretty clear that Glorio is no regular dude. He's quite strong, and I definitely want to learn more about him. I'm sure they'll get into his backstory soon enough. As the trio continues down the path on foot, they're attacked by another wild monster. Okay, now this is really feeling like Dragon Quest Daima. This episode was like a JRPG brought to life. You got random encounters, shops, items that heal you or cause other special effects, fast travel, and a new member for your party. Someone should legitimately make a Dragon Ball Daima RPG. This world specifically is set up perfectly to be converted into a video game. It's almost like Toriyama drafted the whole design document for a video game and is pitching it with this show. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, it's kind of subtle, but sometimes Goku lets the audience know that he's hungry. Luckily, they're able to find a place to eat. After taking down the wild monster and earning 12 experience points, our party comes across this adorable little shop shaped like a teapot. They head inside to eat a meal, get some rest, and save the game. They are served by this blue alien dressed in red, and hey, wait a minute. Oh no. Oh god, no. GT 
continues to haunt my dreams. Okay, this is definitely just a coincidence. This lady is probably a Nakatsuru design, if I had to guess. That man loves him some blue aliens. I can only assume she's the Para Para Bros long lost aunt. Kaioshin looks at Glorio and brings up the question on everyone's mind. Where are you taking us exactly? Our ship is gone, so what's your plan? Are we just gonna kind of wander around aimlessly hoping to find a vehicle we can use? Glorio, who looks stoned, is like, oh yeah, I guess that's true. He then asks the Para Para parents if they have a ship they can use. The old man says he doesn't, but if you give me 8,000 Dokoro, you can unlock fast travel. I mean, I'll sell you a Sky Seed. A Sky Seed is a device that doesn't seem to really be affected all that much by the heavy air and is capable of transporting them a good 120 kilometers. After hustling the price down to 5,000, Glorio buys the Sky Seed. It's no ship, but it seems to be a pretty useful device. It'll help get them to where they need to go. But before our trio leaves the teapot to use this fast travel device, Goku and Kaioshin browse the shop, and they come across a lot of stuff here, including the biggest talking point coming out of this episode. The shop offers a number of Medibugs for sale, magical demon realm candies that have different special effects when eaten. First, Goku finds a revive bug. Consuming one will restore your stamina, so it's basically the demon realm equivalent of a senzu bean. There's also achichi bugs for burns, zutsu bugs for headaches, butte bugs to make your skin smooth, and the craziest of all, the join bug, which allows the people that split and eat the bug to undergo fusion. Simply put, Toriyama is a freaking madman. The potential for medibugs is literally endless. One is a senzu bean, one is basically potara earrings, and that's just the selection at this random tiny shop. Who knows what other crazy medibugs exist in this demon realm? What madness does the upper class citizens of the first demon realm have access to? Is there like an ozempic medibug the rich people eat every week to keep their weight down? This is like a beautiful gift Toriyama left for anyone who goes on to write Dragon Ball in the future. You can attach any effect you want to a rare Medibug from the Demon Realm. I could probably make a whole hour long video speculating about potential Medibugs and what their effects could be just based on the established Dragon Ball universe and what we've seen in the past. But let's take a deep breath and focus only on what we're shown in this scene here in Daima. The fusion bug specifically is what everyone is talking about coming out of this episode. This is obviously going to come back up in the future. We should probably begin with the biggest and most obvious scenario that is most likely to play out. We know Vegeta is coming to the demon realm eventually, and he's Goku's fusion buddy. I think it's safe to assume the two of them will use this bug to fuse, creating a third Goku and Vegeta fusion, different from both Gogeta and Vegito. What would we even call this one? Veku? Kajita? We're running out of ways to combine their names. Well, regardless of what he's named, I can guarantee you this. A new Goku and Vegeta fusion would create a ton of excitement for this show and generate huge money. And that's what this always comes down to. If a new Super Saiyan form for Goku isn't possible, fusion is the best alternative. Gogeta and Vegito are both insanely popular characters, and I can't even imagine how much money those two have generated over the years from merchandise sales, video game DLC, trading cards, has to be hundreds of millions of dollars by now. Turns out, fusing the two most popular characters in an incredibly popular show creates a new, incredibly popular character. So popular, they did it twice. So why not do it three times? An all new Goku and Vegeta fusion is something that would create some serious 
height. And 30 years of arguments about who's the strongest between Vegito and Gogeta and Kajita. On the other hand, they could swerve us completely and give us something crazy like a Goku and Piccolo fusion. Factor in Kami and Nail, and that's like four minds in one body. A half demon, half Saiyan fusion definitely has some potential, but if I had to guess, they'll probably just do Goku and Vegeta again. Let's be honest here. Also, remember the big controversy from episode one about Kabito Kai defusing and ruining the established canon? The unforgivable sin? Well, I wouldn't be surprised one bit if Kaioshin and Kabito eventually share a join bug and fuse together once more, thus keeping everything that happened in Super completely intact. Of course, the lady in the shop says the fusion from the bug is only temporary, but we know the rules of fusion between two gods gets funky. Potara earrings cause a permanent fusion for Kaioshin and Kabito, but only a temporary one for Goku and Vegeta. So why not just have the same rule apply here? The two of them think it's only temporary, then a few hours pass and whoops, looks like we're stuck together permanently again. They try the gas from Majin Buu's belly and this time it doesn't work. I guess they'll have to do something else to unfuse, like, I don't know, make a wish with the Namekian Dragon Balls. This is the perfect way to keep everything in Super completely consistent with Daima. Oh, by the way, there's another weird Kaioshin quirk at play here. No matter what method of fusion, two gods fused always looks the same. So their bug fusion would be identical to the Potara fusion we know from before. Goku and Vegeta, on the other hand, form a fusion that looks totally different from the other two. Weird. It's almost like special rules exist for these guys so they can sell more toys. I could speculate on this for hours, but I'll keep it short. Simply put, it's really exciting stuff. Much like all the Kaioshin lore we were teased with last week, once again, here's Toriyama just casually dropping another bomb like it's no big deal. He knows just the right buttons to push to get the Dragon Ball nerds going crazy. If nothing else, that man knew how to hook people with his storytelling, and that mastery is absolutely on display here. We're four episodes in, and I'm already interested in like seven different concurrent storylines that have been set up. I can't wait to see where exactly they go with this join bug. Goku's like, Please, mommy, I want it. So Glorio buys him some treats that will probably turn this little boy into an unbeatable god sometime down the road. Fun. There is another interesting little line here. When Glorio decides to buy some of the Medibugs, the shopkeep is excited, claiming that we haven't sold souvenirs here for decades. To me, this suggests that Medibugs are absolutely abundant in the demon realm. Everyone knows about them and everyone has easy access to them. Otherwise, wouldn't she be selling a ton of these bugs that provide such godlike powers? I think we'll absolutely see some villains using the fusion bug as well. Goma and Degesu might be a bit of a strange combination, but a Degesu and a Rinsu fusion sounds like a perfect final boss to me. Okay, I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot more of these Medibugs going forward, but let's continue on with the recap. Our trio heads outside and the old man sets them up on the Sky Seed. Hey, it's that thing we saw from the ED. He catapults them off into the distance, and this scene is so awesome. Goku's expressions are incredible. He is so adorable flying through the sky like this. We got some great wide shots showing off the beautiful Demon Realm, but the best part of this scene by far is the music. This Jaka John remix is sublime. I love it so much. Just sell me a CD with Daima's background music on it right now because I need it. This music sells the adventurous and triumphant feeling of this scene so perfectly. At this point, I think I can safely say Jaka John kicks ass. I sincerely hope Daima's composer, Kosuke Yamashita, keeps on delivering these 
banger remixes of the OP. All that's missing now is a remix played during a fight, which I expect we'll finally hear when the time is right. Honestly, the whole show should build up to that moment when Jocka John drops in the middle of the final battle. They bail off their glider and do a Fortnite dive after gaining a huge amount of distance, but they are still nowhere near the castle. This isn't said explicitly, but I assume this castle belongs to the king of the third demon world, and maybe they can get a new ship if they reach his castle, I guess? I'm sure the king will help them out if everything Glorio has said so far about him is truthful. Goku suggests flying the rest of the way. If they run out of stamina, they could just eat one of those bugs that restores your stamina. Good idea, Goku. But Kaioshin and Glorio are like, ew, bugs. No, I'm not eating that. Wow, some demons you are. What's the big deal? Just eat that shit and chase it down with some Coca-Cola, you cowards. As they walk towards the next town, Goku remembers Piccolo mentioning that there were Dragon Balls here in the Demon Realm. Enter this week's installment of Hot Dragon Ball Lore. Glorio explains what we as an audience already know. Each ball is located in each of the three demon worlds, and each one is guarded by a powerful Tamagami. You need to defeat each of them to get the three Dragon Balls. In the Demon Realm, there's no question of where the Dragon Balls are. You don't need a Dragon Radar or anything. They're in a set location. The problem is you ain't getting your hands on them because you ain't beating a Tamagami. No one ever has, and as far as Glorio knows, no one has ever actually gathered the three Demon Realm Balls and had a wish granted. Glorio also claims that the Demon Realm Dragon Balls are the original Dragon Balls. Hey, wait a minute. This is not consistent with canon. Daima is ruined. What a retcon. I thought Zalama made the original Dragon Balls as big as planets. You have some explaining to do, mister. Of course, all this talk of super strong Tamagamis is getting Goku fired up. He's so excited to go out and collect some Dragon Balls that he even does a little happy dance. This might be the most charming thing I've ever seen in my life. Daima's animation staff continues to cook week after week. This is the face of a man who wants to punch some bad guys really, really hard. However, they can't just get sidetracked by these Tamagami. Kaioshin reminds Goku that they're here to rescue Dende first and foremost. So they come up with a plan that satisfies all parties. Since there's a chance Dende could be killed or they simply can't find him, it would make the most sense to go out and collect the Demon Realm Dragon Balls and use a wish to rescue Dende. Then they could use the Earth Dragon Balls afterwards to return back to their adult bodies. This all sounds good, but there's something that is still bugging me, and it's especially annoying now that we're talking about coordinating wishes between multiple sets of Dragon Balls. There's still been absolutely no mention of the Namek Dragon Balls. To me, this is simply inexcusable, and I really don't think this is some nerdy nitpick. If you're reading the original Dragon Ball story before watching Daima, then you just saw the whole Kid Buu fight play out, where the use of the Namek Dragon Balls was pivotal. It's impossible to not think about them in this situation, so you're left asking, why don't they just use them to wish themselves back to their adult bodies? Again, I've gone over this in my past Daima reviews, but I really don't think it would be that hard to write yourself out of this situation. So I'm a bit disappointed that, at least so far, we're expected to just kind of pretend they don't exist. It's probably my only glaring issue with Dragon Ball Daima so far, and it's especially annoying because the rest of it has been so damn great. Our trio heads over to the nearby town and finds a group called the Kempei terrorizing all of its citizens. These guys are the Demon King Special Military Police, and we saw Toriyama's designs for them a while back. The Kempei are named after Japan's military police, which were active from 1881 to 1945. The Crunchyroll subs call them the Gendarmerie, which is a French term used to describe military police. 
I'm going to link in the video description Herms' Twitter thread for this week's episode of Dima because, once again, it's full of some really interesting facts like this. He also provides a ton of translation notes, clearing up some of the nuances of the original Japanese version that might not come across from simply watching the subtitled version on Crunchyroll. Definitely give it a read. Now that Dabra is dead, this evil force is working under King Goma, and wow, they actually did it. They made the much, much smaller statue of Goma. Anyways, now that Goma has taken over, he thinks the literal devil wasn't enough of an asshole, so he's demanding an even greater offering from these poor people. The payment is steep at three gold coins, and for each gold coin someone can't pay, they have to pay with three years of their life. We see their life literally getting sucked out of them by this machine. Big Mom style. Now, I thought the whole sucking life out of people thing was a bit weird at first, but a lot of this is starting to add up. Goma is totally having these Kempei go around to suck the life out of people in the third demon world to give to Neva. Remember the whole promise he made? They're going to suck up a thousand years into this Big Mom machine, and somehow use it to extend Neva's life. I'm assuming he will de-age and become the final boss at that point. Goku watches from a distance, infuriated. He can't just stand by and watch innocent people being abused like this. Could you even imagine a situation where innocent people were being terrorized and Goku just sat there, ignoring it, doing nothing, eating food? What are these pictures doing here? Just as Goku is going to get involved, a tiny mass figure jumps in there first. Out of nowhere, she throws a bomb at the Kempe, and it's a dud. She tries to run off, but is easily captured. Goku can't watch any longer, so he whips out his stick and goes to town. And here, we get our weekly dose of pure, unfiltered Sakuga. We now have four episodes of Daima, and four instances of some absolutely exceptional art and animation. That one year of production time continues to show on the screen, and I love it so much. Goku wrecking all these dudes looks so damn good, and it's so damn satisfying to watch him land those big moves. If Daima can actually give us one scene with awesome animation like this, or this, or this, or this, in every episode, I would be a very, very happy boy. So Goku wrecks like 20 of these dudes and it's so awesome. Our trio runs away from the town they just saved and the masked figure appears. She takes off her mask and it's her. The girl we've seen in the posters and all over the OP, ED, and eye catches. It looks like she'll be joining our party and if I had to guess, we'll get to know her a lot better in episode five of Daima. And here we are. There's 30 seconds to go in this episode and I realize this is it. We are finally no longer in sync with GT. We did it. Turns out it was just a big coincidence. A three episode long coincidence. But they weren't seriously going to keep taking GT concepts for the whole show. Wait, 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 wait. What? What did you say? What did you just say? Oh my sweet merciful god we were so close but somehow some way daima clutched it out we are somehow still in sync with dragon ball gt if this is all still just a coincidence then i am drowning in coincidences here we are now on week four of coincidences <laughs> In both GT and Daima, Goku realizes he won't be able to use some of his regular abilities, a kind older couple cooks a meal for our trio, an evil dictator rules with an iron fist, scamming his people out of their money and making their lives a living hell. And finally, we end both GT Episode 4 and Daima Episode 4 with Goku as a wanted fugitive. You know those Kempe he didn't knock out are gonna head back and tell everyone some spiky-haired kid beat up their whole squad. Then they're gonna send the whole army after them. 
you know what's coming. This is truly remarkable. I have three sets of images here and we're four episodes in. At this point, this is one of the major draws of the show for me. Watching each week to see which concept from GT they pluck next. I can't even imagine what we'll see in episode five, but I'm sure something will pop up that I can add to my ever-growing series of graphics here. And with that, Dragon Ball Diamond episode four is in the books. Let's wrap this up with some overall thoughts. While this was probably the weakest episode of Daima so far, there was still a whole lot I enjoyed about it. Daima is officially four for four. This show flew by for me and I actually gasped when the ED started because I couldn't believe 20 minutes had already passed. I really loved how the whole episode felt like a JRPG come to life, complete with some amazing monster and enemy designs courtesy of Akira Toriyama himself. The Dragon Quest vibes have never been so immaculate. Of course, that fusion bug is a complete game changer for Dragon Ball. It has me so excited to see some new fusions here in Daima. I also have to ask, will we see these bugs pop up again even after Daima is over? It seems a lot easier than performing a complicated dance or getting your hands on the earrings of the gods. I guess we'll find out if it's possible to transport a bunch of these things out of the demon realm for further use. Because boy, does that open up a whole bunch of possibilities if it happens. The scene with the Sky Seed is one of my favorites of the entire series so far, and that Jaka John remix is just perfection. We wrapped up with yet another incredibly animated fight scene, and at this point, it's almost the expectation that we'll get at least one scene with beautiful art and animation per episode. Finally, I have to admit, I do get a sick, twisted amusement seeing similarities to Dragon Ball GT continue to pop up in this show. I fully expect we'll see more going forward. Going into Daima Episode 5, there's a big question on my mind. Will it be able to top the art and animation we saw in Episode 5 of Dragon Ball Super. Remember episode five of Dragon Ball Super? I sure do. Yep, next week, I'm sure we'll be able to compare action scenes from the two episode fives and get a crystal clear look at just how far we've come since that absolute nightmare. Looking forward, next week will probably be all about Ponzi joining our main cast, given the fact that the episode is called Ponzi. We also see Goma in the next episode preview, which is nice since we haven't caught up with him since the beginning of episode two. Finally, shrouded in darkness and shadows, we see a mysterious figure. Very mysterious indeed. Episode four wasn't perfect. I definitely had my issues. As I mentioned earlier, the whole situation with the Namek Dragon Balls really stung this week. I'm still holding out hope that they somehow can explain why the Namek Balls are not accessible, but I'm also bracing myself for the possibility that they just didn't think that hard about it and are hoping you as the audience have forgotten about them too. I also think this episode could have benefited from a quick one or two minute scene with our characters back on Earth. I'm really hoping this show doesn't fall into the same trap as GT, where we ignored our giant cast of beloved characters. I understand last week when we were getting things established that we had to stay with Goku in the demon realm for the entire runtime, but here in episode four, it wouldn't have hurt the show one bit if we cut away to check up on Bulma, Vegeta, and Piccolo back on Earth, just to break up the monotony a little bit. I don't think that's too much to ask, and again, I pray this is something they don't borrow from GT. We need to see what our other characters are up to from time to time. But with that, we are going to wrap things up for today. If you like this video and want to see more Dragon Ball content, please hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Every week, I think I could keep this thing under seven pages, but every week something comes up that gets me typing and typing and the words just keep coming. Between new voice actors and new Kaioshin lore and new methods of fusion, the Dragon Ball hype machine continues to feed us very good each and every week. So look forward to the Daima episode five review and analysis coming soon. 
But until next time, thanks so much for watching, everyone, and take care.